let's get this thing started. So again, uh, welcome everybody to the uh, Crew Meet Seller Growth Summit. We got lots of great information today, uh, so be sure to stick on, stick, stay on the, for the whole thing. We got some special offers at the end. Uh, and again, just so you don't have to ask, yes, it's being recorded. And Jeff and I'll say this a couple times as we go. Uh, Jeff is going to kick this off, and he's got some amazing, uh, amazing information to talk about. And uh, I have to look again, Jeff. We'll, we'll tell everybody again what your slide was about, or what your presentation is about. Again. Yeah, we're going to jump into starting your day. Uh, start the yeah. webinar with start your day. So, um, ready for me to take it? Yeah. So go ahead. Go for All it. All right. Let's get the screen share going. Got to reset that up. I think do I got to turn mine off? Let's see. I'll All turn right. mine off. You you can see what I've got up. There you go. Yep. Yep. Let me get out of your way too. All right. There you go, Jeff. All right. Kick it off. All right. Appreciate everybody in their time today and uh, honored to be part of this lineup of great Amazon sellers and uh, speakers from the industry trying to bring you guys knowledge about kind of what's happening in the space today and how you can maximize your sales on Amazon. I really want to get started on this idea of starting your day. So my name is Jeff Cohen. I'm the uh, head of marketing for Seller Labs. If you're not familiar with Seller Labs, we're one of the first Amazon third-party uh, seller tools in the space. You may be familiar with us um, from our, our tools, Feedback Genius. Now everything is rolled into one tool called Seller Labs Pro. I've been in the e-commerce space since 2005, where I started as the general manager of a textbook website called textbooks.com. So I've been involved with Amazon in some way, shape or form for an extended period of time. And I've watched the ecosystem change and evolve over that time. And in doing so, I try to spend a lot of time analyzing and talking to sellers about what makes them successful. And what I'm hoping that I can bring you in this kickoff session is an understanding of how sellers look at starting their day and what habits we can form um, and what audits we can do and what reports we can use to help maximize the profit in our business. And uh, some of these are things you may have seen before. Some of these are things maybe you've never seen before. Um, but all collectively, what I found is that as sellers develop their systems and their processes, um, they put together their routine for how they're going to start their day. So I question, what's your routine for starting your day? Wake up, have a cup of coffee, check the newspaper, check your feeds, um, get your kids off to school. We all have different schedules for how we kick off our day. This is what I feel is important in kicking off your Amazon day. So that's what most Amazon sellers wake up and check out the Amazon Seller Central app. This is your immediate understanding of what's happened um, over the last day, over the last seven days, over the last 30 days. And the Seller Central app gives a lot of good information. And hmm, most of us probably can admit we check it more than once a day, but it's a really good way to just get a quick look at what happened yesterday, right? And yesterday always is in gray because uh, because it hasn't settled yet, right? There's there's uh, your sales that still have to settle over that time, but you get that immediate look. The problem is, is that before we can measure our success of the day before, we actually have to know what we're measuring. And to be able to measure correctly, we have to be able to set goals. Now we're going back to some really basic concepts from like elementary, junior high, high school, but it's amazing how many sellers I talk to and I ask the question, what are your goals? And typically the answer is, I want to grow my sales. The, the answer is, I want to lower my A cost. But for your goals to be working for you properly, they have to be smart goals. They have to be specific and measurable and obtainable and relevant and timely. So it's not good enough to say, I want to grow my sales. You have to know how much you want to grow your sales. And then you have to understand whether it's reasonable for you to actually grow your sales as much as you want to grow them. By having these goals set, you can then start to monitor whether you're making the progress on a daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, or annual basis. And it's important that we're checking back with our goals over time to understand how they're implementing into our business. 
Now, we know that reaching a goal is not a straight line of success. There's many steps along the way, and there's many different types of goals that we as Amazon sellers and in the Amazon community should be thinking about. We have our sales goal. We have our profit goal. A lot of people uh, talk about sales, but they don't talk about profit. So are you trying to increase your top line? Are you trying to increase your bottom line? We might have a goal for our ad spend, our A cost, or our tacos. We might have a goal for the number of reviews we want to get or the sales rank we want to obtain. These are all different types of goals that we should be considering. And it's really critical and important that you have these goals written down. Because if you cannot look at these goals on a daily basis, how do you know you're working towards your goals? My team has our goals written down on a post-it note. If I was to ask them, they can pull them up and they can hold those goals up and they can tell me what their goals are because they know collectively as a team what we're trying to achieve and individually as, an, in, as a person what they're trying to achieve. So make sure you're writing down those goals. This content is brought to you by Accrumi, the business-friendly funding solution for Amazon sellers. If you are a profitable Amazon seller looking for capital to grow your profits, click the link around this video or visit accrumi.com for a no-risk funding estimate in less than three minutes. Now, once we have the goal, we have to have a plan to get to the goal because otherwise you're on what I call a hope strategy. And you just hope that you'll succeed with what you're trying to do. So as we start to put the plan together, we have to understand that the path to success is going to have many curves and changes. We're going to have, um, uh, we're going to lose our buy box. We're going to um, drop in our profitability. We're going to have returns that weren't expected. And these are all things that we have to be prepared for throughout the day. As we start to break down our goal, we have to understand that our products and our catalog are not created equal. And this is one mistake I see a lot of sellers make. You will not have every product in your catalog be a winner. So how do you look at your catalog and how do you set goals across your catalog? This was actually taught to me a couple of years ago, and I think it's a great example. And I want, I want to continue to share with you called the head, the torso, and the tail. And every catalog will have a head, a torso, and a tail. And it ultimately follows what I call the Pareto principle, which is that the 80% 80 of your effort will come from 20% of your products. 80% of your result will come from 20% of your products. That's the head of your catalog. These are your most important ASINs. These are your high velocity ASINs, your high profit ASINs. These are the ones you never want to get suspended and you never want to run out of stock. These are the ones that on a daily basis, you should be checking to understand how they're doing and how they're progressing because you can't afford for the head of your catalog to slip. If the head of your catalog slips, you don't make your bottom line or your top line. Every ASIN in this section has to have its own goal. You need individual goals for the for either the product or the family of products that fit into this section because they're so critical to the success of your business that you have to know how you're going to grow that. Possibly the goal is to expand that product line. Possibly the goal is to improve the inventory, to improve the profitability, to improve the advertising. So there's lots of different goals that can go into this, but you have to understand how are you going to take this section of your catalog and get it to the next level. The next part of our catalog is what we call the torso. This is the middle of our catalog. It usually represents around 70% of our SKUs. Now, what's interesting about the torso is that ASINs in the torso might be moving their way to the head. They might also be moving their way to the tail. And so you don't necessarily have a goal for every product in your torso, but you want to know who your up and comers are because you're trying to move those five or 10 out of the torso into the head. And you want to know which ones are slipping back. Maybe their end of life cycle, maybe their profitability isn't good and you're trying to liquidate the inventory. This is the big chunk of your catalog from a, from a skew count perspective, but you want to make sure that you're working on the right parts of this. Finally, we have the tail. 
Now, in Amazon terminology, the tail is what we call crap. You can't realize any profit. This is the bottom part of your catalog. You need to be asking yourself, why are you wasting your time? Why are you selling this? Don't become emotionally connected to a product in your catalog. Become financially connected to a, pro a product in your catalog. I don't care if you don't want my dog brush. If you don't want my dog brush, I want to stop selling it. When you pull all of these together, your head, your torso, and your tail, you're able to totally understand your numbers, your projected sales, your total profit margin, your traffic ratio of paid and organic, and your tacos. And you have to be able to audit these numbers to understand how you're doing in your business. And how you look at numbers in your head has to be different than how you look at numbers in your torso or your tail. And this is all about energy and effort. And we want to put our energy and effort into the right skews. And what we end up doing if we don't have a plan for our day is we end up spending a lot of our energy and effort working on things that don't make us money. And that's the one thing I want you to take away from this presentation. What are your money moves? When you wake up in the morning and you're talking about growing your business, what are the moves you're going to make today that make you money? And if you can't identify how this move makes you money, move it to the bottom of your list and work on something else. There's many parts of managing an Amazon business from accounting to advertising to your competitors, to inventory, to listings, to sales, to traffic. And you have to understand how each one of these different pieces ultimately goes into planning your day. What I recommend is you develop an audit plan. Your audit plan will have tasks that you need to do on a daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, maybe annual basis. You don't need to manage your books every day. Maybe if your cash flow is tight, you do. But maybe you just need to manage your books once a week or once a month. By having this audit plan in place, you'll be structured in when you're spending your time on the tasks that make the most sense at that time. Let me go through a few things that should be part of your audit plan as you're scheduling out how to spend your time. Feedback and reviews. Now, I've been a big proponent of people collecting reviews, and Amazon's made it easier by identifying that asking for reviews is within the terms of service. They've made it easier by saying you can use third-party systems like ours to collect reviews, but you still have to make sure that your reviews are compliant. You still have to make sure that the reviews that you're getting aren't part of a larger problem with your product. And you still have to make sure that you're making the right suggestions and updates to your listings based on the feedback and reviews that you're getting from your customers. I like to recommend that you look at, this is going to depend on the, on the frequency for how often you get feedback and reviews. If you have a lot of them, this may be something you want to look at once a week. If you don't have a lot, it's maybe something you can look at daily. Inventory. Inventory is something you want to be checking on a pretty constant basis. You want to be understanding your long-term storage fee risk so you can decide if a product needs to move um, and, and start to liquidate. I had a product in my inventory that was slow moving and I did a calculation and my long-term storage fees were going to be so high that I could actually add a better discount to my product to move the inventory before I got hit by long-term storage fees and get it out of the Amazon warehouse. The IBI score, we're going to get into that a little bit more in detail, but Amazon is really critical around the IPI score in terms of how much inventory you can send in and even around the holidays, how much you're going to pay for your storage. You should be checking your lost inventory and reimbursements. You can choose to uh, do that on your own or use a third-party service. You, can, um, you should always be checking your fees and your sizes to make sure that they haven't changed. These are all things you should be keeping an eye on in your business on a regular basis to understand how they're going to impact your profitability. It's critical to understand your listings. Have your titles changed? Your image changes? Do you have a floor set for your pricing so that you don't make a mistake and give away pricing? Um, do you have your A-plus content in place? Again, I don't recommend you go and build A-plus content for every product in your catalog but you definitely want a plus content for all of the products in the head of your catalog. And as you have up and comers within your torso, you want to work to make sure you have additional a plus content. And we're going to talk about the bonus of the category listing report here in a little bit. 
You want to be checking your profit, calculating your unit economics at a skew level. It's easy to look at your total sales and your total cost and understand it. But what products are actually making you money? When you start to dig into this, you might find that some products are generating you sales, but they're not generating you money. And make sure you're understanding all costs associated with running your business. You have additional overhead. You have the cost of the products, the cost to import, your duties, your taxes, your warehouse, your transportation, your returns, your storage fees. These are all things that you have to consider when building out your profitability. It's not always easy to take the extra cost and break them down at a skew level. But what I recommend is that you want to have a certain level of skew level profitability, and then you want to have a certain amount of business profitability. And so if you're running a skew level profitability at 10%, that might not be enough once you bring in all of your additional cost. If you're running a skew based profitability at 80, 90, 100%, you have the extra fees to cover your additional cost within your business and setting it up to grow. What's your traffic plan look like? How often are you reviewing your traffic plan? Um, are you understanding your difference between organic and paid um, on Amazon and off Amazon? Are you doing post and Amazon live? Um, been a lot of conversation around Amazon live lately and, and the value of Amazon live. Um, I saw a really great conversation yesterday with somebody who's been in this space for a long time. And they basically said, we're a big organization. We're a multi hundred million dollar sales organization. We have people who just do post and just do live and just build a plus content. But as you're growing your business out, each of these things can become time sucks that take you away from doing other things. So you have to experiment. Do you want to be doing post? Do you want to be building a store? Do you want to be doing display ads? Do you want to be redoing retargeting? Amazon advertising was simple in 2016 when we just had sponsored products and the price was really cheap. Today, there's a lot of components to it. Maybe it's beyond the point that you even want to be managing Amazon advertising and you want to look to a third-party tool to manage it for you or maybe a uh, consultancy to come in and manage that for you. These are all balancing questions you have to ask based on where your business is today and what goals you're trying to achieve. Finally, I do recommend you audit Seller Central. Within Seller Central, you have the ability to audit your users, audit your permissions, and audit your third-party tools. All third-party tools um, have what's called MWS subscriptions. They renew on an annual basis. There's something you should be looking at. Um, looking at your user account, who have you given permission to? Are those still the right people? If you give somebody permission to your account and then they do something, you're responsible for that. So make sure that maybe on a quarterly basis, you're auditing Seller Central and understanding that. This content is brought to you by Accrumi, the business-friendly funding solution for Amazon sellers. If you are a profitable Amazon seller looking for capital to grow your profits, Click the link around this video or visit Akrumi.com for a no-risk funding estimate in less than three minutes. Okay, I just gave you a whole bunch of different stuff to audit. I just gave you a whole big plan on how to build your goals. So now what I want to talk about is viewing your content, your data, and your goals through the right lens. And it's critical that when you're looking at this, you look at what's called a macro and a micro lens. And the macro is going to be the big picture of what's happening across your whole catalog at one time versus the micro, which is what's really happening at an individual product level. And it's really important within your system that you're able to flip between looking at your overall business and the profitability or the success of an individual product or a, or a family of SKUs uh, that you're trying to be successful with. Some of the largest brands that I work with, brands that are doing 10, 20, $30 million on Amazon have all SKU-based profitability and SKU-based plans. So when I talk to Amazon sellers and they tell me that building this out at the SKU level is too difficult, what they don't understand is to get it to scale 
to a larger size, this is actually what you need to be figuring out because your business might be working in a macro sense, but is it working in a micro sense? And this brings us back to what we talked about earlier in our presentation around the Pareto principle. And the Pareto principle is something that uh, I've talked about for a number of years. And, and I'm, I'm, I guess I'm not always surprised that people haven't heard of it, but it's something that lives not just in the sense of Amazon. It lives in the sense of advertising. It, it lives in the sense of streets in your neighborhood, right? So, so 20% of the streets in a community will get 80% of the traffic, whereas 80% of the streets will only get 20% of the traffic. So this is about your effort and the results that you're trying to get from it. Are you spending your time on the 20% that gets you the 80% of your out of your results? Most of us spend 80% of our time working on the part that gives us 20% of our results. And this is the big question to be asking yourself. How much are you moving the needle with the work that you're doing? Now, to wrap up my presentation for today, and then I'd be happy to go into some Q&A, I wanted to talk about some reports that I use to help build my business. Um, so I started off by talking about how we want to wake up and the data we want to look at. Then I got into the types of goals that we're going to set and how we're going to look at our catalog. Find, then we went into auditing our report. Now I want to talk about some powerful reports. What I would love to hear back from you guys in the chat, um, and we can talk about them in the in, in, at the end of the presentation, is what additional reports you're using to run your business. We all have different reports that are our money reports, the, the reports that are going to tell us what we, what we are and are not doing and how we are and we are not successful. And it's critical that as a community, we share these with each other so that we can learn how somebody else is looking at their business. Now, most of what I show you today is all available on Seller Central. The value of tools like Seller Labs and others is the ability to take the data from Seller Central and present it to you in more meaningful ways by either adding uh, artificial intelligence or recommendations and suggestions or uh, allowing you to take action uh, and not just have downloadable files. You ultimately have to make the decision of where you're at in your business and what you want to be doing to drive your business. So the first report that I look at on an almost daily basis are the business reports. We have a managed services team that works with several hundred Amazon sellers running their Amazon advertising. When I poll the account managers within our consultancy group and I asked them the most critical report for managing business. It's always the business report. Now, I recommend you look at the detail page by sale and traffic, but there's other ways to look at this at either the parent or the child level. What's critical about this report, what, what's the critical data that you get from here is your session percentage and your unit session percentage. So being able to understand how many people are coming to your page and how many of those people are converting. This is Amazon conversion data. Now, what we can do with this, again, we can go back to applying the 80-20 rule and we can figure out where our traffic is coming from. And now I can make critical decisions such as, am I trying to improve my conversion or am I trying to improve my traffic? So the purple line that you see has only 48 sessions, but it has an eight, percent conversion rate on that particular ASIN. I might want to spend more time on driving traffic because it's actually converting better. If I look at my top one where I have my top traffic, 15% of my traffic is coming in from it, um, 506 sessions, but it only has a 4.7% conversion rate. I don't necessarily want to drive more traffic to that. Although depending on my category, I might, but I really want to get that unit session percentage up because you can see lower on the page at 772, I have an 8.6% conversion. Now, assuming all of these are within the same family, right? They should all be performing relatively around the same. So if I can double my unit session percentage for my product with 506 sessions, 
I double my conversions from 24 to 48 for that product. So we want to be spending our time working on the right result based on what the data is telling us. And what happens, what, what, I, what I get asked a lot by sellers in the space is, well, what do I need to do to optimize this listing? Well, what do I need to do to drive more sales to this product? And they're not asking the right question. Is the product even designed to be driving more sales? Is the product designed to be converting correctly? Why is it not converting? Why are you getting traffic, but people aren't buying it? And that's where you're spending your time working on the money moves by understanding at a product level what's working and what's not, and then applying the fixes to the products that have the biggest impact on your business to ensure that you're getting the result that you're looking for. So how do I use this report? I use this to find products that aren't converting, and I use this to determine which products will benefit from traffic. I keep it that simple. I want to look at every product in my catalog, and then I want to break it down to my head, my torso, and my tail. Then I want to look at each of those products and I want to understand which of these are having a traffic problem and which of these are having a conversion problem. Now, if it's having a conversion problem, I might have to go look at the reviews because my conversion problem might be that I'm actually, I have a bad product. Um, my conversion problem might be that I'm not explaining my product correctly. And so I have to do a little bit of analysis to understand what this data is telling me before I can start taking the action. But one of the biggest mistakes that I see people make is they just start driving traffic and believe that that will solve their problem. If you don't understand what's causing the problem, you can't seek to solve the problem. The second report that I recommend you look at is within your advertising reports. It's called the Amazon search terms report. Now, what's really interesting about this is that Amazon is, this was Amazon's really their first attempt at bringing in data from what used to be called uh, Vendor Central. And this data used to be sold to Amazon um, uh, first party brands for a lot of money. Uh, and now it's made available to us. And we're able to actually see within here the types of searches that are being done what they call the search frequency, right? So they're just rating something um, one to, I think, a hundred thousand or a couple hundred thousand. But you get to see what your click share is and your conversion share is for a particular search term. Now, one of the things that's critical in this is one, it's going to show you trending, right? So if I look at this in March, uh, all the top terms were related to uh, mask. If I look at this in uh, the September, October, it starts to creep up with Halloween. If I start to look at this in uh, the Christmas time um, or the iPhone launch, so the, the stuff will change based on kind of what's happening in the place, in the space. But what I do recommend is that you look at um, overall what's happening with your keywords and your top keywords for your products and understand whether you're competing against products or you're competing against brands. And this also starts to tell you how much opportunity you have. So I know this makes a lot of sense, but I'll still use the example, the Xbox. If I am trying to sell against the Xbox, they have an 85% click share and an 85% conversion share. I'm going to have a very difficult time taking that market share away from them. Whereas if I'm trying to sell a desk, I can, I can most likely win some of the conversion share or the click share for that particular product. So as I start to develop plans around my products and plans around my catalog and plans around um, meeting my goals, I can have products and keywords and targets and understanding of how much share I actually believe I could have for a particular term and how much that term is dominated by established brands um, or maybe brands that I compete very well against. And the way that I've seen our team really use this data is that sometimes maybe I don't want to go after desk. I want to go after electronic standing desk because desk is too competitive and I don't have enough sales volume or review volume or something else that's going to allow me to compete for a generic term like desk. 
If I move to standing desk, it's a little less competitive. If I move to electric standing desk, it's even less competitive. And so as we're designing our keyword strategies and we're designing our strategies for how to dominate sales in a particular term, you don't always want to go after the highest term. I'll give you an example from a customer we work with. A customer that we work with has a top selling product in a, in a very generic category. The problem is, is they're not the lowest seller of this product. And so whenever they try to compete on the main keywords, they usually drop in their sales because their competitors are selling a similar product that's cheaper than them, but they didn't want to lower their price. But what they were able to do is they were able to actually expand their keywords and go after other keywords that that brand was not targeting. And they're able to sell the exact same product for $9 per unit more, which is almost 20% higher price than what their competitor is selling for. So you have decisions to make within your business as to whether you want to compete on price or whether you want to compete on a quality or whether you want to compete on particular keywords. Now, if they wanted to go after that high volume keyword, they probably would have to bring their price down to get there, or they'd have to get a lot more reviews for somebody to say, why is this product different? But if you can't differentiate yourself from the other products in the market, there's still ways to win by having a higher quality, higher priced product. You just have to go after different keywords and they're okay with the fact that they don't have the super high volume keywords. They just want to go after keywords that they can win at the price they want to sell at because selling for profitability is more important to them than selling for sales velocity. And I hear it a lot with Amazon sellers that it's a race to the bottom. It's a pricing race to the bottom. You can turn that around by targeting your price and the quality of your product, maybe the packaging of your product, maybe the images of your product to sell a higher value product to the customer and still gain sales. And maybe you don't get as many sales, but you actually make more money. And I don't know about you, but I'd rather make more money and put more money in my pocket than generate more sales and be able to claim a high, a high top line number. So how do you use this keyword report? Well, one is to find trending terms that maybe you want to update your listing about, right? So by looking at this report on maybe a, a monthly basis, you can understand kind of what's trending. Um, you can be looking at branded keywords versus uh, generic keywords, maybe some updates to your back end. Uh, and you can see how you're competing and whether you can actually win for the terms that you're competing against. Now, if you happen to be one of those top three, then you have a really good understanding of how much market share you actually have and maybe how much you want to kick up a sponsored brand campaign or, or something like that. The other way to use this report is to use it to help you target your auto campaigns. So within your auto campaigns, you can actually do up bids for uh, similar products or competitive products or suggested products. And if you see your competitor's brand um, listed in that, you could say, hmm, I'm a lot like that. So I want to go after and target some of these terms and target um, similar products and such within the auto campaigns and, and bid up those positions. This content is brought to you by Acrumi, the business-friendly funding solution for Amazon sellers. If you're a profitable Amazon seller looking for capital to grow your profits, click the link around this video or visit Acrumi.com for a no-risk funding estimate in less than three minutes. The uh, next report I want to share is the category listing report. Now, what's really interesting about the category listing report is that if you go to your reports and you do your drop down, category listing report will not be there. I'm going to repeat that. If you go to your Amazon Seller Central in your reports and you try to look up the category listing report, this one will not be there. What you have to do is you have to actually message the seller support team and ask for access to this report. They typically give you access for about seven days. Now, what's beautiful about this report, it is the most complex or the most complete um, report that has all of the data on the back end of Seller Central about your products. And so Am Amazon keeps adding more and more fields. Some of those, most of those fields are now in Seller Central, but not all of them. And this is your chance to look at that whole field. 
I recommend you look at this at least once a quarter. Some people look at this once a month. This is your chance to be able to do a flat file update, add additional keywords, add additional attributions, add additional variables that will help your product show up in more places. All the things that start to show up on the left and right about filtering and things like that are controlled in the attributions part of your listing. And if you're not completing all of the attributions part of your listing, you're missing out on additional search uh, or sales opportunities. And typically the difference between a seller that's good and a seller that's great are these little things. And so that's why I started out by telling you that you want to focus these little things on the right SKUs. So I don't want to do this for every SKU in my catalog. I want to do this for the right SKUs that are going to actually make a difference when I do this. Talked a little bit earlier about the IPI inventory performance index. It's become significantly more valuable um, and important to us as Amazon sellers. We now have our IPI score listed in our uh, seller central dashboard. Um, and it's something we have to be very keenly aware of. If we're moving from uh, dark green to red, um, because it is going to impact a lot of our business in terms of the amount of inventory we can send into Amazon, as well as the fees that we're going to pay at Amazon. And while Amazon gave us a reprieve, right? They went from 500 back down to 450. Let's look at the trend in history of what happened, which was leading up to Christmas this year, they had it at 500. So as you're looking at right now, um, Q1, Q2, Q3, you darn well better be thinking in Q4 that you need to be back over 500 unless you want to be restricted in your inventory or pay higher fees for that inventory space that you have at FBA. There's uh, a few ways to impact this report. Uh, one is always stay in stock. Uh, two is to improve your sell-through. Uh, improving sell-through could be through coupons or promotions. Um, always try to reduce your excess inventory. Um, if you're not using third-party logistics to uh, monitor your inventory, it's something you strongly need to be considering. I think the statistic I had heard um, was that was that in 2019, 30% of listings had a merchant fulfilled option. In 2020, 70% had a merchant fulfilled option. This is critical in today's uh, post uh, COVID slash post COVID environment. Uh, and it's something you have to always be thinking about. And uh, if you should have a process for fixing your stranded inventory. Uh, one tip that 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 I have um, heard is that if you're going to stop selling a product, close the product. Uh, that helps your IPI score. So you don't have to delete the product, but you can close the product. But if you're selling the product for a period of time and then you're going to be out of stock or you're not planning to restock it, maybe it's a holiday product or it's uh, an event, a, a tent post product, a Halloween or Valentine's Day, close that listing so that that's not hurting you. It's telling Amazon, hey, I'm not planning to ship this product in right now. And when I am, I'll open the listing back up. Finally is your brand dashboard. And if you uh, are a member of brand registry and you have access to the brand dashboard, there's a lot of data and analytics within your brand dashboard that are critical to you. Uh, the search term optimizer is becoming more and more uh, valuable to us. Um, the, the, um, com customer reviews is, is a place to consolidate all of your reviews. Uh, the brand analytics is starting to give us data across our brand. Um, the ability to start doing testing for our A plus content and impacting our ability to do conversions, um, the ability to do virtual bundles. Uh, Amazon made a decision in 2016 to develop a lot more around the brand and they used brand and brand registry as they call the bar of, for participation to a lot of programs inside Amazon. And if you don't have that brand registry today, it's something you should uh, be, be working on or working towards. They've actually made it easier if you don't have a trademark uh, to get brand registry while you're waiting for your trademark. Again, within this report, I'm regularly reviewing this report. I'm looking for issues that I need to address and I'm taking advantage of the brand assets that I have to help me get a better representation of my brand. 30% um, of sellers on Amazon leave and go check your website. Um, they're going to your store. 
they're trying to see who you are and what your brand represents. So you should have an Amazon store. You should have a plus content. You should have your own e-commerce store. All of these things are, again, incremental little things that help to boost your business over time by showing that you're more than just a third party seller on the platform. Now, finally, I've covered a lot, um, but I want to push this last concept and my team will laugh when they hear this presentation because I say this all the time. Are you measuring your outcomes or are you measuring your outputs? So your outputs are your completed task. At the end of the day, are you telling me how many things you did? Or are you telling me how much money you made or telling me what results you got that you were expecting? Keep this in mind when managing yourself, managing your team and managing your business. If we focus ourselves on outcomes, we meet the goals that we set for ourselves. If we focus ourselves on outputs, we just did a whole bunch of work. And nobody wants to just do work. So to recap, I recommend you start your day with a plan. Understand what you need to be looking at within your business, what value that has to your business, how your metrics in your business are doing, and understand where you need to focus your time and your energy so that you can monitor what matters, focus your energy on what will really drive your business to success and ultimately help you hit your goals. I want to thank Robbie for inviting me on today and uh, would love to answer any questions that uh, we might have. Yeah, Jeff, great, great information. We've got lots of good questions coming in. So let me uh, get them going here for you. Uh, somebody was asking about, uh, can you list the marginal versus item specific cost? I think that was reference to a, a slide you had earlier, if I'm not mistaken. Marginal versus item related. Okay, so item specific cost. Yeah, yeah. So it it gets it gets tricky to uh, to to connect your your profitability at a product level, which is I think what they're what they're asking for, right? Um, and so you can either you know one of the things we've built into our tool is the ability to to drill down into that macro micro level. And to understand how a product is doing and to take all of these statistics that we look at across the board and to and to look at them at a at a product level. It 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 gets tricky though, because you have like ad types that aren't related to a, a product, right? So well, let's take a sponsored display ad or a, a sponsored brand ad where you're advertising three products. How do you um how do you associate that from a profitability standpoint? And so that's where I like to say you have to flip between the macro and the micro view to understand what's happening because you won't get all of your answers in a, in a, in a macro view and you won't get all of them in a micro view. And so you're looking for trends to be able to flip back and, and forth. Good. That's great info. And uh, just real quick. I, yes, we know everybody's asking a lot of questions regarding recording. So I do have a quick update on the recording please stay on. So the problem with the recording is, yes, we're recording it, but you're going to miss a lot of the Q&A sessions and a lot of the interacting uh, content. So we are recording it. It will be available. It could be a while because, I mean, we're swamped. So <laughs> let's move on with the questions there, Jeff. So uh, I've got another person asking, I would like to know more on reports to identify unique profitable products to choose. Is this only for Amazon Wholesale or FBA? Um, so... You know, it works for both. So, so when you say, I guess I get, I, you know, every quite Robbie, you know, this. every question yeah. comes <laughs> back with questions that we need to get the answers to, to be able to answer because yeah. everyone's asking specific about their business. So I, I guess I don't understand the difference between wholesale and FBA because it's, it's wholesale is a way to sell on Amazon and FBA is a mechanism for shipping your products. Um, so if you're talking about like, how do you manage like your own inventory at your warehouse and also having inventory at, at Amazon's warehouse. Again, I think you want to look at the profitability of each of those mechanisms, right? Because there is a different profitability if you're doing your own merchant fulfillment and, um, and if you're using FBA to do the fulfillment. So your profitability at a SKU level, um, you, you might be at an F SKU level at that point, right? Um, where, where the F SKU is different between the, 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 the ASIN is the same, but the F SKU is different between merchant fulfilled and FBA. And you should be looking at that to, to try to calculate 
whether Merchant Fulfilled or FBA is profitable or not for you. One thing to keep in mind is that a lot of people are using Merchant Fulfilled as a backup. So not as a primary, but as a backup. And so they're using their Merchant Fulfilled as their way to stay in stock. And so the profitability might be less. It might not be as profitable to be Merchant Fulfilled, but it's a lot cheaper to lose some profitability with Merchant Fulfilled than it is to go out of stock with FBA and have to restart the whole flywheel. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a good one. And uh, another person, uh, Victor, was asking, on your critical data top two items, 506 sessions, are those for variations that share stats? How does that affect your evaluation? Uh, I got to look that up. That was a really detailed, that was a really detailed question. So we are doing our best. Uh, when you guys list the question, try to you know get as specific as possible. Yeah. Information I, in there. I, that one's a little hard for me to figure. That one's a little All hard right. for me to figure for me to figure out. I, I, I have to. Yeah, I even we'll, see. We'll my, I, even see my, I even see Mike uh, jumped in here with part of the answer. Um, I'm trying to find Victor's question. Okay, on your critical data top two items. Um, oh, this was back when we were talking about that. Okay. Yeah. Um. So 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 yes. Okay, so what he's asking was, is on the slide I showed 506 sessions for two different products. You can have um, a difference in your session conversion between Merchant Fulfilled and FBA. Um, and and so that that can show up as a, as a difference within there. Um, and it could be a variation of one product that, that's selling versus another. So those are all things um, that you need to. And as, as Mike shared, I don't know who Mike is, but as Mike shared, he's correct. That's why you can look at three different reports, right? So yeah. you can look at the um, by parent or you can look by child. Um, and again, you want to kind of toggle between the parent and the child to understand um, what you're trying to um, what you're trying to get solved. Um, and I see that somebody else asked, where is this report? So yeah. the business report is is e pretty easy to find within Seller Central. Um, I'd actually have to look on Seller Central to see what the drop down is that, that leads you to business reports, but it's it's a field right within there. Whereas the category, uh, the cattle, the category listing report is on the reports tab, and then it's part of the drop down um, yeah. after you've requested it. Yeah. So just real quick, we only got about uh, nine more minutes before we got the next session launching. So we're going to try to get through these as fast as we can. Uh, somebody was asking about what was the full term called category. Uh, if you scroll up a little bit there, Jeff, you'll see that question it should be marked with a Q. Uh, question. I tried to mark them for oh, the, you. The name of the report. Yeah, I think that's what they're asking. Yeah, let's uh, let's. If not, we can move on to another one. Yeah. And, so this uh, we'll is this is best. the report that you're looking for. It's the category listing report. There you go. There you go. All right, then another question came in. Does this concept of optimizing keywords apply to FBA only sellers? My understanding is that a seller can only qualify for making A plus content if they have private label. So you do need brand registry. Um, I, I'll, I'll differentiate between private label and brand registry because if you're a, if you're a wholesaler and you have a relationship with the wholesale company, it is possible to get brand registry um, even if you don't own the brand. So you do need brand registry to be able to create A-plus content. Yeah, Gary had one, and I actually have seen this on some of the uh, different uh, groups and stuff. Uh, finding it a little confusing about figure out what attributes correspond to the product. Is there a way to figure this out? I've seen that one, Jeff. Uh, give him a good answer on that. Yeah, there's a, there, there, you know, so one of the things you get when you download this, this report is you actually can, um, you you actually can can um you you get all of the like test that you can and can't do and it gives you all of the acceptable answers within it so uh, that that tends to be the hardest part of flat files within amazon is knowing what you can and can't um respond back with um you know personally i like to answer with everything that i can answer about the product now again it's really easy if you're talking about an iphone because you have to say the color the make the model mm -hmm. uh the the amount of space you know all that type of stuff when you get into some generic products there's a lot of attribution fields that you can fill out about a dog brush right is it right-handed or left-handed right 
Um, I think that, again, look at your competitors, look at your competitors listings, look at what shows up on the left side of the screen, um, which is which is the different nodes that Amazon uh, can can make available. See what types of attributions are showing up for other products in your category and, and at least ensure you have those. That's a great way to at least make sure you have the 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 basic ones. Yeah. So this one, actually, I'll answer this one for you, Jeff. They, uh, how do keywords help me if I'm selling existing brand name products? They don't. You don't own the listing. So <laughs> you don't have to worry about keywords. All right. We have, I'm sure we have some more coming in here. So uh, CSN. Oh, uh, yeah, I've already, sorry. We already, we already talked about the recordings. So uh, check back in on the notes. Uh, Victor, thanks for helping out there. We got lots. Uh, keep it simple. <laughs> yeah, that's true. K-I-S-S, keep it simple. Uh, I won't go with the last word. Uh, which report <laughs> interprets IPI into most profitable SKUs by market classification? Which one was that one? Uh, uh, go up a little further. And it's A-M-B-R-O-S-I-O. You should have a Q next to it. It's, uh, it's up a little ways. Okay. That's the top of my list. Okay. Um, Repeat it one more time. Let me hear it. Yeah. So I'll just go with it. It says, which reports interprets IPI into most profitable SKUs by market classification? Uh, he, IPI, that's a good question. Uh, it, there's no connection to that right now. You know, IPI is more of the ability to go into Seller Central and Amazon's going to tell you these are the pro products that you have a problem with here and the problems that you have a product with there. Um, you know, one of the things you can look at is like sell through rate. So, so if you have inventory at a, at a third party warehouse, it, by its general nature, Amazon wants you to be turning that inventory. I like to say four to five times a year. So think about a retail store, right? Think about if you owned a physical retail store, um, when you walk into that store, there's new inventory that's there all the time. Right. Um, and, and they don't want that inventory just sitting there. You wouldn't want to go to the grocery store and find something and find that they stocked the Oreos in January and they're still selling the same Oreos in November. Right. So Amazon thinks about their warehouses in the same way. Um, they I, I'll get to a very clear distinction here. They actually don't call them warehouses. They call them fulfillment centers. They don't want you to think of their warehouse, their, their center as a warehouse. It's a fulfillment center. They want their inventory. They want your inventory coming in, being listed and selling. And that's basically what IPI score, um, you know, covers. If you, if you look at the, the excess inventory sell through stranded inventory and, and how often you're in stock. So they want your product in stock, but they don't want you to have too much and they want you to sell through it pretty quickly. And then if anything is not working, they want you to fix it. <laughs> right. So they spell it out for you really easily. Um, personally, I had a lot of trouble with this in, in, in my Amazon business. And, and I basically partnered with a 3PL who um, handles 90% of this for me. So they're, they're watching my inventory and they're shipping it into Amazon when they, when they need to. Um, they're removing, you know, they're, they're, they're working with me to, to handle excess inventory um, and take care of stranded inventory. And for me, um, I did have to sacrifice a little bit of profitability, but it wasn't as much as I thought because I was shipping my products in from China. They were hitting the dock in California and going straight to Amazon. But I was having to bring products in from, from China so often that my shipping costs were actually higher. So by moving to a 3PL, I was actually able to buy more, put more into a container, reduce my shipping cost, pick up my 3PL cost, and basically balance the whole thing to where it didn't impact my overall profitability very much. That's good info. Uh, Christine was asking about brand registry. Uh, Christine, on Amazon, there's an entire section that talks about brand registry. I advise you go there to Seller Central, read all about that. because. Uh, Jeff could go on forever, but we do uh, need to wrap this up here pretty quick. Yeah, I want to hit uh, up Steve. I want to hit up Steven, who's a who's an Oreo sales rep for twenty years. So, like, uh, why don't you reach out to me? I need some of those Lady Gaga Oreos. There you go. 
All right, we'll just go one last more uh, one here. If uh, we are out of stock, can we temporarily close the listing in order to avoid Amazon negative ratings, which affects the inventory minimizing from Amazon? I think you talked about that already. Yeah, I don't know what I don't know what you mean by negative ratings, but um, I don't know that it's some. If I'm going to be out of stock for an extended period of time, I consider closing the listing. If I'm there, there are. Um, there are back and forth attitudes on this. So don't just say Jeff said to do it. I'm going to start doing it because there are different um, thought processes here on, on whether you should close listings or not. Um, you need to kind of look into it a little bit more, but um, I, you know, I used personally, I used listing closing around uh, Christmas because uh, Amazon was, was, selling my merchant fulfilled orders and I wanted, and I'm sorry, they were selling my FBA orders and I wanted to save my FBA orders because I knew Amazon could ship FBA faster at Christmas than I could. So I shut, I closed my FBA order. I ran my merchant fulfilled orders. And then um, I think the, the Friday before Christmas, the week before I, I, I turned off my merchant fulfilled and I ran my FBA. So there's different ways to use closing listing. Um, you know, to, but you do impact your business in doing it. So uh, I, I used it specifically around that. And I've used it around uh, inventory that I know is seasonal. So like I had Halloween versions of my product that won't be back in stock. I don't want to be dinged on IPI for not putting that back in stock. Um, so I, I closed that listing and I'll reopen it in, in uh, August or so when I'm ready to, to, to reamp up my Halloween stuff. All right. Hey, great information. Uh, Jeff, real quick, I and mean, one answer on it. What is better spent advertising coupons or sponsored ads? Just quick answer. <laughs> it depends. <laughs> I know it's a long one. <laughs> um, they actually go hand in hand because okay. if you're running coupons correctly, your ads will promote your coupons. So yeah. you actually need, you, you, you know, this is a whole presentation on its own, but to make advertising work, you have to be able to pull 10 different levers at one time for things to come across to your customers correctly. Yeah. I'll make this really easy, everybody. Jeff's going to be on my podcast. So be sure to have those questions that you missed available and we'll be sure to answer them when he's on the podcast. I think it's in like a month or so we, we got them. Yeah, on, and reach so. out to me on LinkedIn or reach out to me on Facebook. And, and, you know, you, I always say this, but you can email me Jeff at seller you go. Um, I, you know, personally, I, I want to thank you for having me on. I know you've got other speakers, ah, but if you take a, a quick minute, give me a review. Tell me how I did on this presentation in the comments. Um, one is, is I was a horrible waste of your time. Five is, this was the best presentation. It was worth your time. Let me know. If I didn't get a five, don't put it down there. Just email me and tell me what I could do to do better in the future. So thanks for go. having me on.